I read somewhere that if you're recording audio, you should drink water, not coffee, because it dehydrates your voice, because I take my work extremely seriously. Anyway, these are the books I've read in May. I think there were six in total, so let's get into it. First up, Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz. This is a mystery inside a mystery, a book inside a book. Always love that as a concept. It's a kind of mystery thriller, but I would say much heavier on the mystery than the thriller. It's not one of those like super fast paced crazy thrillers. It's much more of a mystery whodunit inside of another mystery who done it so the premise is that it's a modern day kind of contemporary editor reading a book that has just been delivered to her by one of her writers she is reading this mystery novel and that's where we start and then we dive into the novel itself and that is a whole kind of plot within itself which is a sleepy english village with a kind of poirot style detective character who is there to solve some crimes that have gone on in the village. And that part is a real love letter to all of those classic mysteries, the Poirots, the Sherlock Holmes kind of stories, all of those really traditional mystery novels. Anthony Horowitz has written two Sherlock Holmes novels and a number of James Bond novels, as well as worked on TV writing, script writing for uh, Agatha Christie, I read. He is a master of the genre, you could say, of a kind of contemporary take on those traditional classic murder mysteries. I think this is very well done very clever, masterfully plotted, while also having a kind of modern take. So it's not just an old fashioned traditional mystery. So we get this mystery novel inside this other novel. And then when we get to the end of it, and it, it is a full kind of book that of the entirety of Magpie Murders, it takes up maybe half. So it's a real story in two halves. So when we come out of the novel, we follow the editor as she kind of becomes the detective in the modern day to find out what's happened there. And I don't think it's a spoiler to say I think it's on the back. If not, I'll edit this out. I thought it was very satisfying and clever a lot of fun just a really good little mystery who done it great as an audiobook it's read by two different narrators and the female narrator is Samantha Bond who was Miss Money Penny in the Pierce Brosnan Bond she's a great reader really enjoyed that would recommend this as an audiobook i thought it was really nicely uh, done and just a good kind of audiobook to listen to because it was pacey but not too over the top I wasn't like lost with what was going on but yes a nice modern kind of take on the classic mystery genre so if you're into that kind of thing I think you would maybe like this this is the first of a series there's a second one now called Moonflower Murders and I think that it's going to be a full series so there will be more I think I would read the second one sure why not so yes enjoyed it would recommend just like a wholesome detective murder mystery. Next I read Beach Read by Emily Henry. This is a super popular rom-com romance novel that everyone is really loving. I'm also currently reading another one of her books right now which is called Book Lovers, the new one that just came out recently and I find them very similar. I haven't read the other one that she's written in between those two 
but I find the two of them very, very similar, not only in the kind of characterization in a way of the male and the female characters, but also in the flow of the storyline. Like if you were to plot everything that happened in each book on a graph, I feel like it would be an almost identical chart graph thing flowing. You know what I mean? Which isn't bad, just that it seems actually a bit repetitive. Maybe I shouldn't have read them quite so close together, but I thought it would be kind of nice to have an easy, simple book to read. That sounds really rude. No, just like a light-hearted romance on the go. I like to kind of have on my Kindle something that's really easy reading if I'm reading something else that's not because before bed I don't like to read anything that's too like plot thinking brain thoughts because it either keeps me up or I fall asleep and then I don't retain anything so that was a really elaborate way of explaining that I um, am also reading another of Emily Henry's books right now so maybe I shouldn't have read those quite so close together. Beach Read is about two writers uh, called January and Augustus and they are purportedly opposites so January is a romance writer and she's like sunshine and rainbows and Augustus is a sort of moody like literary fiction writer and he's serious because also he's a man. I'm not sure I bought the premise of them being polar opposites because first of all they're both writers so how different could they be for comparison? You know, they're both American writers who, through a variety of chances, end up living next to each other in these houses and eventually they find out that they're both there to write a novel, which I would say is actually quite a lot of common ground compared to, say, an oil rig engineer and a French pastry chef, for example. Uh, so I'm not sure that this is like an opposites attract kind of setup that it tried to say that it was, but it's basically a rivals to lovers romance, which has got a kind of background of books and reading and writing being the kind of um, thing that brings them both together. So once they meet each other, they find out that they're both writing novels and through kind of banter and getting to know each other, they decide to challenge each other to change genres. So they will take on each other's genres and Augustus will write a romance novel where people fall in love and end up happily ever after. And January will write a serious literary fiction book. It's like a bit of a challenge and they're trying to outdo each other. In the process, they get to know each other and life happens, etc. I didn't find the characters or the characterization or character development especially deep on this one. Uh, January was just kind of exhausting and Gus was, I guess, hot and moody. He didn't really have especially a character of his own particularly. He leans against things a lot, if that's a character trait. He's kind of rumpled and, you know, he's got a crooked smile and his hair's always messy, like, that's pretty much it. But that that's kind of showing that he's deep. Whereas January is supposed to be this kind of fluffy romance writer, but actually she also has hidden sorrow. But I'm not sure that I actually necessarily felt a great amount of that as being moving to me. I had an okay time, but I didn't like, love the love story, I didn't love the characters, didn't love the plot, I wasn't like obsessed with finding out what was happening, um, but it was fine to just kind of have on the go. But I think some people really love this book, so I think this is a me problem, not a book problem, because loads of people love it and find the relationship between the two characters really, um, you know, fulfilling when they get together and really enjoy the banter, but I didn't really find that it did super much for me. I think the issue with this one for me is that there wasn't much conflict or 
kind of much standing in the way in terms of plot for the characters to come up against for there to have been any kind of development that felt satisfying so at first they were kind of rivals and they didn't like each other and then quite quickly and for no particular discernible reason they were in love and kept saying how wonderful each other was and there was no particular reason why that happened it just was and I find that to be a bit meh like the plot was thin on the ground there wasn't a lot going on so it didn't seem like there was any impetus for change to have happened in their relationship but suddenly they were like super besties and having the best time together and gassing each other up and it was like well why are we rivals in the first place there was clearly no problem which is exactly the same issue i have with the current book that i'm reading book lovers because they're supposed to be like hating each other and they clearly don't hate each other so what's the point if they're not really rivals what's the point of them being rivals in the first place can't they just be co-workers or you know acquaintances they don't need to be like this big thing where like i actually hate you and then five minutes it's like oh we're in love like nothing happened anyway it was fine didn't have a bad time it was fine and then it was over but i'm still reading the second one so you know i haven't abandoned it so i'm still finishing it then I read It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover and I've got a whole video on me reading that so I will keep this short and succinct so I'm not repeating myself a lot. I don't like it, don't like it at all really. I uh, didn't have a great time. I thought it was kind of cheesy and kind of rushed. Just generally the characters did my head in. The way they talked to each other was ludicrous. I didn't like much of the story i thought it was romanticizing domestic abuse didn't find it to be an empowering emotionally inspiring tale i think a lot of people really love the characters in that book they love the relationship because there is not a lot else there like i thought it was just really emotionally manipulative i think i'm probably the last person to have read this anyway so i'm sure everyone knows what this book is about but I just couldn't get past that. Like the characters are weird in that book. Just everyone is weird. The whole premise of that book is like, there's no such thing as bad people. There are just people that do bad things or something. And I just found that to be like such an oversimplification of domestic violence relationships and a romanticization of domestic abuse and it just did nothing for me i wasn't like it was impossible to enjoy that book for me because the subject matter was handled in such a way as to be so it, it was so opposed to my outlook on life that it was impossible for me to put that aside and to enjoy it for what it was which i think for a lot of people is like a tragic love story a doomed love story and where the male character is a sort of tragic figure and i couldn't see him as a tragic figure so for me the entire time i was like get away from this man and when she did i was like thank god but like maybe be single for five minutes anyway if you want to see my views on that one there is a full video to go along with that so feel free but i didn't enjoy it and i don't know if colleen hoover is for me um i know some people have said that this book isn't necessarily typical of her general output and that i should try reading verity i think it's called but not right now there's a lot to be getting on with there are a lot of books in the world and not for the moment but we'll see never say never next i read the diary of a bookseller by sean bythel and it's exactly what it says on the tin it's the diary of a bookseller of a real life bookshop um it's called the bookshop in wigtown in scotland which is a book town so they have a lot of bookshops and book festivals and things like that going on and it's basically a diary entry format of his time 
owning this bookshop. He still owns it, that makes it sound like he doesn't anymore. He still does. His voice is very sarcastic and I think some people don't find it very funny. I think some of the reviews that I've read have mentioned that he's kind of mean about customers and he's kind of harsh about the customers that come into the shop and the sort of stories he tells about customers. I would say anyone that's ever worked in retail would probably find that completely acceptable because I, he doesn't really say anything that terrible. I think it's his sense of humour. He is what you would maybe call a caustic wit and it's kind of a sarcastic delivery while also um, being a little bit mean because some of the customers are nuts. So it's kind of what makes the book funny or interesting to listen to. So he talks about these different characters that come in. Some of them are repeat customers from the town and some of them are people that work with him in the bookshop. And it basically just follows like a year, I suppose, um, in his life of running this bookshop. And it's kind of humorous and lighthearted, but at the same time also kind of delivering the truth about the difficulties of running a bookshop in a kind of Amazon monopoly and how hard that is. If you are someone who enjoys reading and you may also labor under the delusion that it would be lovely to open a bookshop one day and that that would be a really nice way to spend your days and earn a living, this will completely demolish that idea in your mind. So if you wanna kind of put the smack down on your bookshop dreams, this could be perfect. Although, you know, having said that, he has written a book that's been successful and the bookshop apparently is still out there doing great. I would love to go there. I've never been to Scotland and I would love to visit and go to the bookshop. Um, they also rent out the bookshop on like Airbnb so you could stay there like actually overnight in the bookshop, which sounds amazing and it's completely impossible to book it because it's booked 5,000 years in advance. So why won't they let me visit them? I would love to go and stay in the bookshop. But aside from all that, I did enjoy the book. I listened to the audiobook of it and it's narrated by an actor called Robin Lang. Robin Lang, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. He did a really great reading of it. I really enjoyed it. He has this really like soothing Scottish accent, which I really enjoyed listening to. Love a Scottish accent anyway. I would argue it is potentially the best accent. It was a nice, audiobook to listen to also because it wasn't too intense so I think maybe that's one of the issues that some people have read it as a book and found it to be at times a little dull and repetitive but I was listening to it while I was unstacking the dishwasher so it worked perfectly for me during that kind of time it's kind of like if you've read this is gonna hurt by Adam Kay it's like kind of the book version of that in slight format as in like it's gonna shock you with its horrors but ultimately it's kind of heartwarming although it's no not as bad about shocking you with the horrors as this is gonna hurt it's kind of that sort of vibe also i really enjoyed in this book how he mentioned that one of the books that people ask him if he's read most often is any human heart by william boyd which i've only recently just read myself and i've heard so many people raving about it so i thought that was like really relatable because people were constantly like you should read this book and i was just like i don't really want to read it i don't think it looks very appealing i think maybe the covers are all a bit crap and it just looks like not the sort of book that it is and then I read it and I was like oh my god I love this book I live on this book this is one of the best books ever like I that book was so much fun it's like a romp through kind of an entire person's life through like history but also through their own personal life I'll talk about this another time but it's just such a like just grabbed me by the throat and had me there the whole time and it's just funny because he said kind of the same thing that he was like oh you know people kept recommending me this book and then one day i just eventually picked it up and started reading it and then i was like oh my god this book is fucking amazing i just thought that was very relatable on the whole i enjoyed myself with the bookshop and it's not jam-packed with action it's not really like plot based it's just an interesting look at someone's life running a bookshop and if you're a book person you probably like it 
book people like reading about books don't they what was weird about that book actually now that i think about it was that one of the things that he talked about really often is that loads of people come into the shop and a don't buy anything which is fine like i go into bookshops all the time and well it's not fine for him clearly but um I think it's normal to go into bookshops and browse and not buy anything. But then he also said like the vast majority of people seemingly haggle at bookshops, which I had never considered in my life. I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know it was socially acceptable. I guess it's not socially acceptable. That's what he's kind of trying to say. But I had no idea that that was a thing that people did. I just go into a bookshop and either it will have like the price on it or you just go, how much is this? And then they tell you and then you say, okay, and then you buy it. I had no idea that people would just go up to booksellers and be like, what kind of deal can you do me on this? The audacity, I can't believe it. Yeah, I mean, maybe don't do that in small independently owned secondhand bookshops. Seems a bit much to me, but people are wild. Can't wait to hear what these earrings are gonna sound like. bad probably. The article that told me to drink the water didn't say anything about loud earrings so then think about that ahead of time. We'll see how it goes. Next I read The Farm by Joanne Ramos. This is easily my favourite book of the month. It's a fictionalised take on a kind of luxury surrogacy business where extremely rich like billionaire clients use the surrogacy company to set themselves up with a host who is a woman that will carry their babies for them. The women who become the hosts are highly selected and selected for their attributes to make them a competitive and uh, appealing host for these clients. So they will pay more for a white host who is highly educated, for example. The hosts are on this facility and are monitored for the entirety of their pregnancy and they can't leave, they can't be left unattended. They are constantly monitored because they are essentially just like a host for the precious cargo, which is all that anyone really cares about. It's a really interesting moral, ethical, all of the questions. It asks a lot of questions about what are we already doing, what would be okay to do, like the questions about class, race, wealth, privilege, about the ethics of surrogacy in this way, about kind of paying for surrogacy and about paying for um, selective kind of characteristics and the traits that are prized by these people and I think it's very sensitively done the way that it was presented I thought was very very cleverly done I think a lot of people based on maybe the blurb the description of it in some places airs very much on the side of almost sci-fi like it goes quite hard on dystopia and I'm not sure that it's a dystopia. It feels like a very current and pertinent thing that could be happening right now. It's definitely not a handmaid's tale. It's much more present day than that. And I've read some people that maybe expected it to be a bit more sci-fi. And I think some people almost expected it to be horror. That expectation led them to not enjoying it so much. So I would expect it to be literary fiction. With literary fiction with dystopian elements, let's say. Dystopian ideas rather than a dystopian novel because I don't think that that's accurate. I thought the ideas that it did present were really interesting, very credible. Like I think it's completely plausible and something that is worth considering as you know, science and progress and technology allows us to have these new frontiers of what is possible and at the same time women are put under brand new pressures to do everything and be everything to be billionaire ceos but also to be mothers at the right time to make sure that by the age of 30 because it talks about kind of the forbes 30 under 30 by 30 you should be at the top of your game and you should be in the 30 under 30 but you should also have the time and the ability to have a baby and how do you do that and if you have lots of money if you are maybe a high-flying billionaire do you then outsource 
that element in the way that you would outsource to a nanny and if you would let someone raise your child why not let someone carry it all of those questions i think are super interesting but it's definitely more about race class wealth than it is about like a sci-fi tech dystopia it's very character driven and we sort of see the story unfold through the eyes of a number of different characters who are involved in this facility in various different ways the main character is called jane and she is an immigrant from the philippines and she has her own baby daughter already her point of view and her priorities and the reason why she's doing everything and the reason why she becomes a host is for her daughter and because she wants to have a better quality of life for her and this comes up as an opportunity for her to make some significant amount of money. One of the other characters that we see is also the director of operations at the facility so she's kind of running the show. She's a really good like foil for the opposite of the hosts in a way. She knows what's going on, she has contacted the client, she knows everything whereas most of the hosts are just kept completely in the dark. She is kind of keeping an eye on everything but also quite often manipulating situations and manipulating the hosts to make sure that they are doing things that are kind of optimal for the facility really that's like it's like the house always wins i suppose their interests are in some ways in direct conflict at times she is basically just trying to get a healthy baby out of these surrogates she doesn't necessarily have the best intention so it's an interesting ethical conundrum how far she is willing to go to do that and we kind of see her galloping over those boundaries at times high jumping over those boundaries to get an optimal result but for whom the characterization is brilliantly done. You really get into the mindset of all the different people, what's driving them and why they do the things they do, I thought was very well done. And to be able to write in quite different voices very effectively, I thought was really well done. I think it just did what I would want a good novel to do, which is you enjoyed the novel, but it also gave you something else. Like you either learn something or you think about something. It gives you new ideas or new things to think about, but it's not done in a way that's like hammering you over the head with it. It's just those two things coexist. And I think that for me is what makes a really successful novel where you're able to have an enjoyable time because the novel itself is well written, it's pacey, you know, it's whatever it is about it that makes it um, compelling, while also maybe having something at the end of it that you feel like, okay, I got something out of it that was more than just the time that I spent reading the thing. So I think it was very good at doing that. I think it brought up a lot of interesting questions about the monetization of reproduction for a start and also more specifically kind of the lengths that women are forced to go to to kind of to succeed to thrive and to have it all i think it was an interesting um kind of combination of like people at different levels of society. I think it does all this really successfully without being obviously a morality tale. I didn't feel like it was trying to tell me this is what you should feel about this. It wasn't prescriptive. It just kind of presented the idea and gave you a lot of room to interpret, come up with your own conclusion. Because I also, reading the reviews afterwards, I think a lot of people read a very different book to the one that I read. I don't know what they were reading. I think I got a very different ending out of it than other people did. And I think that maybe colors the meaning of the book. Everyone's interpretation is different. That's kind of the whole joy of the thing. I didn't think it was a perfect book, but I thought it was very well done. I think this is a debut as well, which is very impressive. Like one of the characters is um, a baby nurse and a uh, sort of nanny, someone that helps people raise their children. And it kind of sets up this idea of, you know, if you would pay for the best to raise your children, 
when do you start you know is is it at birth or if you have the resources you could find someone that will give that child the best start from before they're even born would you do that but then seeing why people do that and the toll it takes on them really puts into perspective that even when you buy something like that it's never free of problems obviously because the people selling it the people that are willing to do that are doing it for a variety of extremely complex reasons everyone's got a full fleshed out life they're not just pawns and side characters in the main person's life you know this i guess it's the idea of like having a main character moment which is very popular at the moment maybe we all need to have less main character moments and more everyone is equal moments and everyone is equally special and complex and maybe that's what we need to remember that actually other people are not just there especially if you're a rich person other people are not just there to service you in return for money they have a whole separate set of motivations and a whole separate set of feelings thoughts and everyone is equally as human and i think this is what this book did very successfully I've just noticed that I'm wearing a New York t-shirt and the farm is set in New York state and city. So this looks like I planned that, but I didn't plan it. It was just a coincidence. And last but not least, A Float by Danny Couchman. This is a memoir centering around one woman's life on a narrow boat. She is a 25 year old voiceover artist when we first begin her story and she, after living in a variety of substandard London accommodations, decides to, on quite a whim, buy a narrowboat. The book is basically about her experiences with boat living, but also her life in general. And I wouldn't normally kind of flag up trigger warnings and books because th those things can be so different for everyone. So I would assume anyone that's got any specific triggers that they try to avoid would look up the book that they're planning to read. It's impossible to cover all the possibilities unless you're actually you know, doing that specifically. But with this, it was quite unexpected so i would just mention that there is some discussion of sexual assault that she experienced in her teenage years it's not the main part of the book but the sexual abuse that she experienced in her teens is something that she kind of comes to terms with i just wouldn't want anybody to go into this thinking nice book about boat life and be kind of taken aback by it because it's not something you'd maybe necessarily think would come up in this kind of book. So just as a content warning, that is part of her story. And it's not a massive part of the book, but it's just, it is mentioned kind of as something that she comes to terms with. But generally the book is set over a period of years and it's about her living on this boat. And I picked it up for exactly that reason because I am really interested in canal boats, boat life, just gagging to get on a boat, would love to buy a boat, would love to go on a boating holiday, just obsessed. And everyone that knows me thinks that it would be a terrible idea and that I wouldn't cope on a boat and that boating life isn't for me. So that's devastating. I thought, okay, I'll read a book about this and see how it really is. And this was very good on that front. I thought it was a really nice overview of one woman's life on a boat, really. Unlike me, who is like, I'd love to be on a boat right now. Wouldn't it be great to buy a boat? She just went out and bought a boat, the absolute mad lad. She just went and bought a boat. She didn't sit around thinking, should I buy a boat? She didn't read books about boats like me. She just went and bought a boat. I. I'm on a bit of a ban from reading memoirs of people who I don't already have an interest in. I had read a number of memoirs that were like highly regarded that everyone was recommending as great books and found quite a lot of them not working for me as something that I enjoy reading. Like I, I get quite, I don't know, just, I read several books which made me say no more memoirs 
unless you already are interested in the person. Reading a whole load of stuff about someone's life who you actually don't know from Adam and don't particularly care about and you sort of have to sit there and be like, okay, thank you for telling me all this, but like, did I ask? Which is obviously not something that everyone feels because memoirs are a huge genre and lots of people love reading memoirs. But I personally need to actually be slightly invested in someone if I'm gonna read a memoir by them. But this was enough about the boating aspect that we could step over that issue the royal we we me it wasn't a problem for me because it really is about her life in the boat at the beginning she buys the boat and then she kind of learns how to drive the boat sail the boat it's more driving isn't it it's a narrow boat i really like the like descriptions of her life kind of nomadically she has this kind of boating family of all these people that she made friends with and they call themselves the flotilla and they sort of move around places together and in the summer they have these lovely like lunches and dinners on the towpath and she has a dog swimming in rivers and nature and birds just outside your window but at the same time there's also the really hard things the challenges the cold winters having to constantly do DIY she talks about how having a boat is kind of like having a second job, like having a part-time job is all of the upkeep of the boat and how all of that was really difficult and like how to learn um, to do all those things and get really handy. Just the everyday struggles of like emptying the toilet and where to shower and her boat setup was actually quite minimal so some people have like washing machines and full fridge freezers but she didn't have any of that so she actually was like kind of at times roughing it and trying to make it work while still coming across as like a normal person to um, the people that were working with her because she was going into two voiceover acting work and I enjoyed that kind of contrast and the kind of over overview of boat life. It's just a nice enjoyable time reading about someone else's life isn't it? Like it's just interesting to see what other people are doing with their lives. If you're big into boat content or small living, off-grid living, um, kind of nomadic lifestyle stuff, I think you'd maybe enjoy this. A glimpse into someone else's life on a boat. Still really want a boat so it hasn't put me off. So I still very much, the dream is alive. I still think that I could do a boat, even though everyone thinks that I couldn't. I think they're wrong. I don't think I'm too much of a baby to be on a boat. I think I could do it. I'm convinced. But maybe I do need to do a boating holiday before I commit to a boating lifestyle. So maybe I need a hint, a trial of a boating lifestyle before I um, commit to boating as a concept. That's it. Those are the books I've read in May. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for watching and I will see you soon.